And every time I see some scoops like this on a car, I start thinking about next year's plane. Scoops. Everywhere I look, I see Corvette scoops, Porsche scoops, Testarossa scoops. And are we dreaming about next year's plane already? You bet. Now, since we've been back from the Nats, these are the things that seem to be little upgrades for the Testarossa, little things that, uh, of course, now that the Nats is over, can't go back and relive it, but I like the way the the little bit pointier spinner looks. This is the European spinner that used to be made in Poland. And it fits right into Rich Oliver's back plate, which is real nice. So, But of course you can't buy them anymore like everything we do. We're just dead in the water on that issue. But we do have one. We don't have one for a four-bladed prop or for some of the other things, but... So once we actually are back from the Nats, the thing is now I can kind of have fun, do some of the tests that are very time and labor intensive that you really don't have time to do before the Nats. The problem is before the Nats you get a setup that works, it's like going to war with the army that you have. Well you can't be playing right up until the last minute, but you know what, now I can play. And this is one part of the season I thoroughly enjoy. Because what I have, I know how to play and flew for the whole, basically the whole contest season so far. And now I can see if I can get anything, push the envelope just a little bit, a little bit further. Now the spinner, believe it or not, was a big addition because what it did, it accented the square maneuvers. Without making a plane corner harder, it looks like it's corner and harder. At least from the pilot's perspective, and I'm going to try to shoot some video today. Now the reason I got out here today late, I wanted to get some of this swirly, thermally dead air where our field is, see, it's here's the thing, it's concrete or, or blacktop, and you can see the wind is already swirling around. Not, not real high wind, but it's swirling. And it moves constantly. So where, where we are, you usually get the heat coming off the runway, and at this time of the day, we're about at midday, it, you get these updrafts and swirls and crazy air. The air comes over the trees, from so from certain angles, you you really are challenged. But, but one of the things that makes that a little bit easier to deal with is when you have a prop that drives real well. Now, one of the things, Rich Oliver's prop has been exceptional. I mean, we used it at basically the whole season. Doran's props test out real nice, except in really, really crappy air. In fact, they're, by having both of them, I really have a wide range of choices here that I normally wouldn't have. But the thing we always want to have is our cake and eat it too. And the only way we're going to do that is by doing some prop testing today in this really swirly, crappy air. It is officially, officially, now I have a little thermostat, a thermostat, a thermometer in the car, so I can get a rough idea just what the air outside temperature is. And we've, we've just, we're sneaking up on 100. It's going up about a degree every 20 minutes here. So what I want to do, I want to take some square one flights on the prop that we've always used, which is Rich Oliver's prop. And then I have two other of Rich Oliver's props that have a little more pitch, and in this really high temperature, I mean, this is really, this is much hotter than it was at the Nats. This is Houston air. And then I also have a 15-4 Bali that I got from Randy Smith, and I'm gonna try right at the field. I, I brought the balancer and the cutter. I wanna cut a little bit off, because I know it's not gonna be 15, so, what I've already done is cut it down to 14, so I start pretty much where Rich's prop is. But it's a much thicker blade, much wider blade, so I assume it's going to basically wind up somewhere about 13 and a half, 13 and a quarter. So we have test props. As always, we'll get a square one flight and get back here and hopefully uh, learn something today in this swirly air. Now, just as an example, this this to show you how crazy this air is. We are absolutely stone dead now, but when we're stone dead at this field, once this concrete heats up, you have air. In fact, if you look, some of the, some of the time you can actually see the plane just rising for no reason at all. It'll come around over where there's a little bit of a thermal and just rise up. But, but the truth is we had these conditions pretty much 
dead air conditions at Brodax for one of the two days. And we had it on top 20 day, the most important, well, for me, the most important day of the year, trying to make that cut. And, and a lot of people got hammered. A lot of people were very uncomfortable dealing with the dead air or the swirly air. So practicing in this, let's see what we can, uh, if we can learn something. And certainly the, the answer is always on a day like that, when it's really hot and really dead, is to get the prop that drives the best, the most drive possible. And maybe that Bali will be a little upgrade. Maybe it won't. If it is, I'll send it down to Rich Oliver. If not, I'll just keep it. Maybe Midgley can use it on his 65 ship. Now, luckily, Rich keeps track of all these props. And actually, one of the APCs, the 14.5 uh, the APC, has worked well on John DeTavio's plane, on Buddy Weeder's plane. We've never had it on this plane yet, but today's a good day to do some testing. Now, what I'll do, I'll set the camera where I think downwind will be, but if you look real close, you'll see there's some crazy air going on up there today. Now, a good thing on a day like today is you're not even tempted to try to hit four foot bottom. There's, there's no way on a day like today with the swirly, unpredictable air and you're going through your own wake that unless you're looking to lose a ship, that you can come down and think that's going to happen. Now, I hope, oh, I, I need the other wrench for this, isn't that That shows you what I know. Like I said, we need the metric wrench. I, I haven't even put it in a toolbox since we haven't been taking this prop on and off. I want to try, again, the, the the key thing I wanted to try today was the Bali, but I will try the APC, and I will try some of the other ones, just to see if any of them have some potential for these conditions. I don't remember who it was at the Nats that was trying to tighten props. I remember seeing with the four-way wrench, and I kept, I kept thinking that's crazy. There's going to be an out. A spinner doesn't fit this prop. Ah, ah. Okay, we'll fly without the spinner. We want to just see where this is going to go. It'll probably fit the other spinner. It has a bigger cutout anyway. All part of the thrill, the thrill of victory, the agony of the boy. Is it hot out here? Houston, help me. I always thought that, in my case, the heat would hurt other people a lot quicker than it hurt me because I do a lot of work outside. But this summer, between all the rain, see some of the things we've learned is, in this season we've made what I think are some upgrades. This fueling system that Rich Oliver has where we can meter the fuel and I can back out three turns, four turns, whatever amount I need, that system is bulletproof. And you almost never get anything like the wrong amount of fuel in there. In fact, I haven't had once had it shut off prematurely or run more than about 10 or 12 laps. Because once I play, I find out where I am, I can pull out two or three, and that's that's been an upgrade. Now, see, I'm full. Now, I know with this system, I back out four, I'll have 10 to 12 laps. Now with prop testing, what I want to do now is I want to leave the mixture control where I had for the square one flight with Rich's prop. I've also been trying to blot up the fuel from underneath the stoop because this area, we put a lot of time and a lot of money actually into getting this area cleaned up. And I don't want to be the guy that wrecks it. Anyway, we want to attack this, get some idea where we are relative. Because again, Richard's props have been, de they're developed. They've been proven under a lot of conditions. And the only way you really know if you have an upgrade is I have to take a flight on Rich's prop, a flight on this prop, go bouncing back and forth. Kind of not pay attention to the geometry. Uh, in fact, if this, if this shows a lot of potential now, then I'm going to start cutting it down little by little by little by little. 
and then I'll have to open up that spinner opening. Or I'll just have to use the other spinner. Boy, I love when the motor's hot like this. Oh boy, is it fun to start. Puppy, you're not cooperating here. This is not fun. Come on camera. Oh, it's red hot. Boy, the concrete's red hot. You can't even touch it with your hand or anything. Okay, what we're going to try to do today, these are tests of the 15-4 the Bali, and we're going to start cutting it down flight by flight until we see if we can get what we hope is going to be a uh, the, run of, the run very similar to the Rich Oliver props.
Now it's lucky that I bring the Dremel tool to the field for just these these kind of things because this prop really has shown us some real potential and I want to start cutting it little by little by little. In fact, I'm going to try to tripod some flights. It's given me so much uh, encouragement. Let's see if we can get any flights off the tripod. And again, now that I got the CG back, I can get... And by the way, you can buy these right from Randy Smith. And it looks like... I would start, if you have a 76, start at 14 and start cutting down until you get the, run, the load and the run that you want. See what we can get off the tripod. Diameter down to 13 and a half. 
The next step is I'm going to take another half inch off the prop, get it down to 13. Still a little bit too racy. And what we've been doing is each flight trimming the prop diameter because it started out obviously 15 is too much. We're down to just a little over, I think it's 13 and an eighth right now. And it's just getting about where I want it. But this is, I want it to be pretty close to the speed and the load that Richard uh, Oliver's props are. On the little thermometer I have, it is now officially 100 degrees. I'm in Houston. 
Hello, Rich. I'm in Houston. So this is the kind of thing that that's so unpredictable about the Northeast. We had a whole month of just rain, rain every day, just before the Nats, in fact. And now we've had a week of almost every day is near 100 degrees. And every morning I've got a water. And we got this thing going for two hours every morning before we look up that heat. Oh my God. And I don't even know if we're going to go flying today. It is really hot. They're predicting over 100 by lunchtime. That's amazing. Every day on the way to the flying field, all I see is scoops. Scoops and more scoops. It's a nice color, by the way. It might look good on a, uh, on a new ship. Very cool. We need inspiration. It's the time of year we need inspiration. But we are cooking. We are in Houston. It's hot. It is really hot. Actually, it's given us a real good opportunity to test some of these props and pipe setups. And I have a, a well, I'll explain it when we get to the field. I have retrofit the spinner with a carbon spinner. Got the CG moved way back. Want to try some of that. Did some more work on Randy's prop. But the heat, the heat is really oppressive. Oh boy, even in this hot weather, they're out here burning up that road jet fuel. Now what I usually do is, I let Rich and John have all the good air in the morning. Because when I do my testing, I like to fly off the stooge. Well, what's the good news? How you feeling? Okay, you should have been here before we had a fox. You had a fox here? Yeah, over there on the grass. A red fox? Ah. He was unbelievable. Maybe he's still there. Too bad, no. Too bad you wasn't here. To Watch you throw a candy. chicken over there or something too. Yeah. Bring some salami. He was laying down watching us fly. Really? Unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. Actually, I got the whole session in and didn't see the fox once. I think these guys are hallucinating from being out in the sun too long. But one of the things I did get a chance to do today, as I wrap this up, I had a chance to go back and forth with the various props, same as yesterday, in some really, really high heat here. This is really, this is about as hot as it's ever been here. I don't ever remember it being this hot. Now, one of the things I wanted to try was, and this is the four blade cutout spinner. It's carbon fiber. Peter Zwati used to, uh, no, these are the ones that come from Medusa. And of course it's cut for a four blade, but I wanted to try it. It lightens up the nose when I put the light hardware on. All the light hardware, I can get almost an ounce out of the nose. And it really makes a significant difference. Now, I hadn't flown the plane much with the rearward CG because I thought, at least in my own mind, I thought that the, uh, the performance was pretty good when it was relatively nose heavy. But what I'm finding out now is as I'm, as I'm getting some more and more weight out of the nose, it's just getting better and better and better. I'm winding up moving the lead outs in conjunction with this. As we get the CG back, of course, the lead outs have to go back. And it's been very eye-opening. There's still a lot of performance left in this plane. Now, when I finish the wheel pants, then the final thing is I'm going to retweak that flap. I really can't do it until I get the wheel pants on and I've worn the wheels out so much now that the gear legs are rubbing on the ground so that's kind of I better get busy and sometime in the next day or so get get start to get some finish on the wheel pants and what I was going to do today when I get home I'm gonna pull this this spinner off and paint it red just so it looks a little more like it matches the model anyway so we have the choice now is rather than adding flywheel nose weights we have a carbon fiber a Euro and a Rich Oliver, all with various nose weight combinations, and none of them add just a, a sheet flywheel, a steel flywheel. All of them at least add something, well, I hope, something positive to the plane anyway. Another good day, another fox down the drain. And I'm just hoping that we get another couple of days in this heat because what I'm what it's allowing me to do too is simulate the conditions that usually are at the net. Super, super hot. Air density, we're about at 85 right now. And then I get to at least get a feel for 
how the plane's going to trim and how I'm going to get the power to work under these conditions. It's a little bit of an advantage to have some time like this. And one of the things I wanted to do today, because we're working on this rearward CG thing, I wanted to, well, I'll explain this more with a little storyboard, but I'm going to have Dave Midgley make me up a little plug so I can make my own carbon fiber cones that'll fit into Rich Oliver's back plates and be a, well, a few grams lighter anyway. Anyway, I, another thing is I was explaining to Buddy Weeder about pigmented paint, decanted paint with extra pigment. Now you can see this is red going right over black carbon fiber. You just wanted to show when you have that extra pigment in there. And boy, with this 100 plus degree weather we're having, this is going to dry in five minutes. Now another thing, when it's really hot like this, you never want to put dope to dry in a bright sun. It can take the temperature if it's 90 or 100 degrees outside, but what it can't take is the sun baking it, especially on a carbon fiber part. That is a no-no. So I'm going to get one coat dry. And this, there was a significant increase in, in performance anytime you take the weight out of the nose. And in this model in particular, I think it's going to be a, an interesting thing. Getting some time with the CG rearward handle shrunk down, all the things that make for, uh, well, an interesting end to a flying season, I guess. Anyway, we'll get some of this painted. We got a lot of little shop projects today to work on while this is drying. But we're gonna be experimenting with props and the rearward CG. Yeah. We also have the option with this spinner cone to uh, test any of our four bladed props which we may or may not be doing. But right now we want to get back to working on those wheel pants while we have this incredibly hot weather. I know the finish will dry quickly. Now it's always good, we're back to working on the wheel pants for a little while, it's always good any aeropoxy light, actually any two-part thing. Should be cured in 24 hours, but if you let it sit, especially out in some heat, what you, the, the gain is you take your little dowel with some sandpaper and you've got a relatively quick, here's what happens, it comes off like powder. If it doesn't come off like powder, one of several things can be wrong. You didn't mix part A and part B, each in their separate tube mix them. Then when you mix the two parts together, they have to be measured accurately. It's all the directions are on the uh, the label of course and when you let it dry a lot of people put the material on and you know at 12 o'clock midnight and 7 in the morning want to sand it 24 hours I would think is the minimum the other part is I would any heat you can put on it is going to make it better now in this case here's our friend the old prop well, we use this prop for a million things put on a little slicky back paper and here's just one of the things it's going to get this fillet area in here for us now because we're in this heat wave, I had these out on the, the dashboard of the car and boy they were cooking. You almost couldn't touch them. But it dried up nice. I have all my little tools. Another thing too makes a great uh, is a kicker bottle. Sticky back sandpaper. I want to get this radius in here. And then what I want to do tonight, I want to get one coat of clear dope on these. Just brush on a coat of clear, let it dry overnight sand that out and see where any of my high spots are. That temperature out there is unbelievable. I spoke to Rich Oliver. It's hotter here than it is in Houston. Unbelievable heat. Anyway, these are real nice. Using these to get up in the radius area. Again, a lot of this is just patience patience and more patience and trying to get whatever the vision of the shape you have in mind of the wheel pants when you have wing mounted wheel pants it's a pretty intensive thing to get them to track right to be at the right CG location you don't get to move them not much 
So a lot of things have to be right before you invest the time. And I just want to show a nice one at almost exactly the consistency of balsa. The other thing that's real nice is because we have a coat of thick CA on this, we're not tending to go right through. And when we're all done, I'll put a, another coat of thick CA on any spot that I sand through down into the wood. Now with a bigger radius, and the nice thing about the kicker bottle, it's a little soft. So you can get right in there. Get that radius exactly what you what you want. Now we've been trying to work with these props. We're trying to get actually the thing we're spending a lot of time with is I'm trying to get the plane re totally retrimmed to fly with a more rear or more rearward CG. And somewhere on this or the next tape, I'm going to put what a list of my uh, my goals are and my findings so far. I think, but I'm not sure because I spoke to Rich Oliver today and he's pretty much going to try this a similar thing of getting the plane to balance a little further back. Give it a little more of a power steering feel. Of course, there's a price to be paid. Yeah, it's going to work out real nice. Now, as soon as I get the other one sanded out, brush on a coat of clear on this, let it dry overnight. So for breakfast this morning, Woody the Woodpecker is joining us for breakfast. Now we have a new little friend, he looks like a fledgy, who was eaten here about five minutes ago when Woody came. Woody, <laughs> Woody chased the fledgy away. Now we also got a fledgy that we call Hangout Harry. He just sits out on a feeder. He eats and then he sits out there like it's a lounge chair. I don't know. Woody's going at it. Weather report today, what, Care? 100? It's 100 with a heat index of 110 to 120. Feels like Arizona. Feels like Except Houston. It's humid. Feels Houston. like Houston, Houston right. to me. Houston. Forget it. More like we go to see Rich Oliver without, look somebody else just came, without having to uh, pay for the, uh, the gas to get down there. Yeah, nice paint job. The Woody Woodpecker paint job here. Woody, you're making me tired. Maybe we could hook him up to sand those wheel pants out. Feel like sanding some wheel pants today? so hot maybe we should sand wheel pants. <laughs> Look at the spots on this guy. We see one, Since we've been putting these block feeders up, we get all kinds of, we, these are the birds we normally get, these little brown ones. Now look at this guy, has got spots. We got woodpeckers coming, we got the little yellow guys. It's amazing, look at the size, how big this guy is. 105 to 110, 110 plus. Oh boy, just what we need. Just what we need. Well, it'll be good for prop testing, that's for sure. <laughs> now one of the bad things about going to our flying field when the George Washington Bridge backs up, we lose an hour here. But if you can look across here, you can see they're leveling out the area that's going to be, you look right out there, that's where our new flying field is going to be, right there. They're leveling it off right now. Look at this, all these, all these cutthroats cutting in in front of me here. That's where, that's going to be the land for our new flying field, right off Route 80. You'll be able to see it from Route 80. That's coming, they're working on it. Rich Jack of Bones been working with them. I can't wait, possibly next year or at latest, two years from now, have a three-paved circle flying field, and we'll still be able to fight the traffic every morning, because this is the way you'll have to go to get there. What a thrill. Well, we got a full day of flying in some, some pretty nasty, gusty, over 100 degree air. The spinners worked out fine, and I want to keep making notes of the little changes that I'm making. I have the CG way as far back as I can get it now and it just keeps getting better and better and better. Now, obviously, one of the things I need to do real soon, because we're going to put the wheel pants on, I should have them painted by the weekend. And one of the things I want to make sure is that I have plenty of prop clearance, and I'll show why. See, with these, I put even bigger wheels on just to get more prop clearance. These are the wheels off the bomber. 
couple of reasons, because we're going to be flying a couple of contests over grass, Midgley's contest and I think Lee Mass is over grass. So I, and I just want to be able to take off out of the grass. I have the gear bent a little further forward than I normally would. I wanted to see if that was going to make any real trim change. It didn't. But we're ready you know, as soon as those wheel pants are painted. And sooner or later I'll get the time. I want to document all of the things we've done with the props so far. And we've had some real good luck with several of the different props. And with this trim change. This trim change is something that actually almost anybody can do to, uh, to any ship that you've already got built. So being able to have more than one, I guess, trim change or a place that you'd like to trim a plane. In this case, and it's not that difficult. Boy, the wind is really kicking up now. It's not difficult to figure out. Having more choices is always better than having less choices. Now there's only one thing left. And if you can see, the grass has grown back up here around. And I weed whacked this down several times. I have the weed whacker here. And it's my turn to do the weed whacking. And we usually take turns. Brian will do it one week. I'll do it the next week. But there's, when you fly into this grass and you hook lines on it and everything, it's just a pain. And we've got such good use out of this field, especially where the stooge is mounted. And out here where we stand, once this is all weed whacked down, it's usually good for a week or so. So if we do this once a week, we're usually in good shape. Anyway, this was, this was not the worst session, even though we lost about an hour waiting in traffic over by the entrance to the bridge. That's getting to be more and more common with every day, but not much we can do about it. And it looks like they have the ground leveled where our new flying field is going to be. So a lot of cool stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. this out as we go past the local Lamborghini dealer looking for some ideas on scoops some of the hot rod cars in here I guess you can't really see look at the orange one oh, that's some cool stuff there cool stuff scoops ideas for next year back to the shop it's too hot to be out here now because of the heat the I've got four coats of Brodac Clear brushed on here. Got some 320 paper, sticky back of course, and I'm just gonna just dust this off. And then I wanna get a coat of silver on here because the silver is gonna show me all the little flaws and all the little mistakes. And it's so hot out here, it is unbelievable. This, I think we, we've already set the record of a few days already for uh, the New York area. I don't know about the rest of the country, but boy, this is murder. And the other thing I was hoping I'd be able to do, maybe I can get some of my little dissertation on the, on the tape today with what we've been learning with this rearward CG. And I'm going to make up a, uh, another four-bladed prop. Doran sent me some more four-bladed props to test. I want to get one of them while I have this spinner that's cut out for a four-blade. That'll make that pretty handy. But this is the whole key. We put this on an hour ago, and it's dust. And when it's dust, you're done. We actually, if we wanted to put more coats on, we could put more coats on, just put it aside to dry. Another thing that's really handy is when I can take this out in the bright sunlight, I can candle it and I can start to see little spots where this is gonna need, it, it may need another coat of clear. Because what happens, as soon as you wind up breaking through into the raw wood, and you can see, because of the wind, it's just powdering off and blowing away. But we really wanted to make, I hope this is going to be a, uh, and if it isn't, I'll make another set. I hope these are going to be a little more practical. Now we got a set that are really stylish and futuristic. And we certainly, they're not, they're not unusable. It's just that I expected, well, a little higher standard, I guess is the right word, in terms of performance. But whenever you get too carried away with the cosmetic part of anything, you wind up paying a price somewhere else. There's always like the, uh, the reality check on cowling shapes and things where you can't choke the motor. And you don't really, I don't really want to sand through unnecessarily here. So I want to get that coat of first coat of silver on here. 
You can see this stuff, it's just, it's just powdering right off. And this is a, about an hour ago I put the last coat on. Now, again, I've said it before, I don't leave it out in the sun. I leave, the temperature is fine, but not to leave it in the sun where it's gonna bake and possibly bubble. I want to, at all costs, avoid bubbling. Anyway, we're gonna be ready to shoot silver in a few minutes. Now this is silver that's just got just the slightest little bit of talc in it. Kind of silver color. I can see we already got a lot of dry stuff, so we're gonna need a few coats. But in this temperature, you can guarantee this is going to dry up pretty quickly. Notice I'm trying to use the sun to, to make even a, a better view of where the bad spots are. Because this is our first sand out, there's plenty of dead spots. Plenty of dry spots where we've, we've kind of gone through. But this is just going to be used as filler. It's got a little bit of talc in it. And we're just going to let that sit. Put it over there to dry. And notice I have these in the shade for drying. We give that about an hour. Well, in this temperature, maybe even less than an hour. And it's going to take several sand outs to get rid of the little spots, but we know we have a lot of dry spots, a lot of little spots that are going to need red lead, but I think two or three more sand outs, and we'll be ready to put some red on there, see what these are going to look like. Now, over the course of this summer, and in the Testarossa, we got to try quite a few props. Doran has uh, had, we've had some good luck with Doran's props under certain conditions. The other thing that we've had, and we've run these several times, and I really like these on the Spitfire. These are the ones made by Sergi Belko. And they really, on a, on a smaller, lighter plane, they really have some potential. Now, the one thing we didn't do yet this summer, and the, one of the reasons we didn't, is we didn't have a four-bladed spinner. But we got a four-bladed spinner now, so I'm going to take some of my four blades, check the pitch on them. I've got a couple of them that I have never had on a plane before, and Doran sent two brand new ones. Gerald Champ donated two of them. So from this selection of props, I want to get one four blade today. In fact, what I want to do is put a little bit of a, a real quick summary of what we've learned so far this summer. I just thought I'd do a quick summary of the five real dominant props that we've tested in this summer and some of the results that we've had. Because the first thing most people that, are, that have bought a, a Rojet 76, they need a prop. Buddy Weeder, the, among others, that, that in the beginning needed to know which props are going to be the ones to buy and which are the ones that are going to evolve out. Now, again, this information, even though it pertains to a Rojet 76, probably pertains to any 75, 76 size motor, Randy's motor included. Now, I've, even up till today, the, the best prop, the number one prop, is Rich Oliver's two blade, and I have three of them. A full 14, these are props he's made. I have one that's been chipped and, and had the tips taken down, 13 and a half and 13. Now, the three diameters, one of the things that changes and it, it can really work in your favor, in fact, it's one of the things we're working with now, is the bigger the diameter, this, this seems to mute the corner some. This seems to give it a little more corner. And of course, down around 13, you've got a much, a much quicker, faster reacting because of a, what it, in essence, what's a smaller gyroscope. 
Now, I spent some time, in fact, I spent a couple of days. I had gotten a 15-4. Al Raby had told me, try that prop. And Al Raby is using that right now. He's developing it and working on it. And I wound up starting cutting it from 14. I just kept cutting it, cutting it. In fact, I even had some some good flights with it there. That was that was actually almost a flyable day. It was it was one of the days that I remember getting some good flights in the course of a day, a gallon of fuel. But somewhere around it's around 13 and a quarter now. I don't want to cut it anymore because the load is about right right now. But we're gonna do more with this. We got more of these coming. I'm gonna get a few more of them. These are props you can buy right from Randy. Not a problem at all. Now the the ones that we've had incredibly good luck with on the Testarossa and the Spitfire. Doran's three blades, full 14 inch, pitched to four and a half. Now they come four inches of pitch. I've wound up pitching them to four and a half. And now the only downside that I found on these props is in really high wind. They don't drive as well as Richard's prop. But if, as an example, Rich Jacobo never flies in high wind. When the wind gets crappy at the field, he goes home. Well, if if you were never going to fly in 15 mile an hour wind, that's certainly a choice. Now, again, what happens here, the nice news is you get a great rotation. These props are lightweight. They don't have a lot of resistance. They don't present a giant gyroscope in the front of the plane. So you have a very fluid, easy to turn corner. Now, this is what the next step is. And somewhere in here, we're gonna be working with, and I've got several of them, Doran's four blade, Rich Oliver's working with some of these right now. When I've had them on a Spitfire and on, on Miss Ashley, they seem to be around 13 inches. In other words, a full 14 inch prop is way too much of a load for that motor. And they need to be pitched up. Now, for the 65 that runs at a, a 10,000 up RPM range, they don't have to be pitched up. But for our RPM range, we're running right around 9,000. Pitching them the four and a half works right off the bat. Now, I've pitched and made some of these props for other people. And I, as all of the ones that have been flown already have been pretty close, right on the money. Now, the other thing, and Richard has made some wood props, and I've had some good luck. In fact, I've got about six of them now. Some of them came from Kent Tyser. The rev up wood props, again, light. You can leave them full diameter. The motor, in our case, runs in the range that the 76 likes to run in. It's a good combination. Again, not quite as strong as what I'll call the number one prop, a square one prop. So at this point in time in history, our square one prop is still the three props we got from Richard. The 14 inch, when it's really blowing, that 14 inch goes. The 13 and a half adds a little corner, lets it, lets it be just a little snappier in a corner. And the one that's 13 inches now, that really lets it rotate, but at the cost of a little bit of drive in the overhead eight. So this is what we've gained so far in a course of, I, I mean, this is a, a condensed amount of information. And I left off the one prop that I should have put on here because I don't have it anymore. Buddy Weeder's got it. We had, and let me, let me, let me not uh, go through it. I would add it as last choice, the APC. And this is a 14-4. A and it's a 14-4W. That's a prop that's made for a special RC event. You can get them right from APC. Very inexpensive and very close to being the right load and the right pitch. If you're looking at, see, because you can't really buy rev up props anymore. If you're looking to really do this on a budget, this is the way to go. Round off the edges and whatever you do, don't flip it with your bare hand. But, so you got a lot of choices. If we were to do a semi-scale plane next year that required a four-blade prop, we'll have that choice. If it, like Rich's Stuker requires a three-blade prop, if you're just looking for performance, I'd say stick with the two-blade props. And if you're looking to save money, 
go with the APC. But you've got a lot of choices, and I don't think any of the choices here would be a bad choice to start off with if you have a Rojet, especially if you're new to running a Rojet 76. This, this could be good information for you. Save you some time, save you some money. And without any hesitation, I'd say spend, spend the, the money and get the props video and check it out. That's, that's the best investment of all. Cheaper than a prop. Now the other thing we've been working on, and everything up to the Nats was done with the CG preset because I had the, the CG from Miss Ashley and I really tried to keep it in exactly the same percentage. And I didn't change it that much, but I found that if I moved it a little bit further back it got better, but there was always a trade-off for a lot of reasons. Here's what I'm suggesting everybody do. Now, once we get to the part of the year, right now we're done with the serious competition for the year. Now I'm moving this CG back. And the way I'm doing it is I have a carbon fiber spinner now on the plane, lightweight spinner, a lighter prop, a prop that's physically lighter than the one I used at the NAT. So getting rid of some of this nose weight. What that's allowing the CG to do is go back. But it's also doing another thing. It's worsening the problem that we already have because this weight is above the vertical CG. So by taking some of that weight off, it makes the bottom even heavier. Ultimately, I'm going to have to readjust the flaps if I keep going in this direction. I'm at the point where I'm, I'm just flying through it. But getting the CG further back, even a little bit, it gives you a lot of choices. First off, what happens, the plane rotates a lot cleaner. Let me make a little list. Now, every plane that I've ever seen, or any plane that you buy plans for, should have on it where, where the CG is recommended by the designer. A critical thing is before you fly the plane, bench trim it, whatever, is get the CG. Start where the designer said to start. But now, when it gets to the point where you want to, you want to, try to dial this plane in for your personal feeling, well, a forward CG is going to give you a lot of benefits. Having a plane or what we would call nose heavy, it, it typically is going to be stable, easy to fly in level flight. It's usually going to have a little bit of a high stick load, which a lot of people find to their advantage. People that are nervous and twitchy, a high stick load smooths that out. Getting, getting a plane that's stable, a high stick load, it'll usually do nice rounds. Nice round maneuver, nice level flight, and nice inverted. Well, you can see right now, there's a lot of round maneuvers there's other reasons that having a forward CG might ultimately score better than a rearward CG. The, the nicest part about it is it usually makes a plane very easy to fly. For newcomers, beginners, guys coming back, I would always recommend a forward CG. But now, we've gotten through to where, where our normal CG is, and I wanted to experiment. Now, the benefits might be if this is done correctly and not overdone. In other words, if, if you move the CG back a slight amount and you don't get any gain, a little more, no gain, you're probably at the optimum point already. But find in the optimum point for you. The optimum point for Paul Walker and the optimum point for the beginner guy that builds an impact are two different CGs. Okay, the, the, the rearward CG is going to tend to be unstable. Now, most expert flyers acknowledge that it, it'll get a little twitchier, a little harder to fly inverted or upright. This, this is not a big negative thing if you're an expert. A light stick load. Now, this is something Rich Oliver and I talked about at length. The, the ability to just twitch the plane and make it turn without having a lean on it. The advantage of a rear CG is you'd probably 
you're trading away some of the round to get nicer squares. See, the thing that always happens with stunt, almost everything, there's a trade-off. You give one up, you get something in return. This this might be that it's it's twitchy, a little bit more difficult to fly in level laps or in square legs, but a little more difficult to fly. But everything is a trade-off. So what happens is with our rearward CG, the plane immediately became a little more unstable. In, in inverted flight, I had to constantly be working to fly it. But the nice thing was the stick load lightened right up to the point where I could, I could almost be flying it off my fingertips. I noticed, even in looking at the video, the squares were more defined. And when I looked at the Nats video this year, it seemed like the judges were, were giving nice big scores to very hard cornering squares which if you if you play that game and you want to get your plane tuned into what's scoring well well what you'd really like to have is a plane that you would know where the forward CG is if for instance at the world championships they're buying big smooth round maneuvers you probably want the CG forward if you go there and guys are darting all over the sky like a flight streak and scoring well, you probably want a rearward CG. I would say for sure at, at any world championships, you'd want the forward CG and probably at our Nats, the rearward CG. But anyway, plane gets for sure a little more difficult to fly, but up to a point where you can fly it. In other words, a new, a new pilot, an old expert. Hey, old expert. The more stick time you have available, if you're like Rich Oliver and you get to fly every day, or uh, any of the experts that fly a lot, this isn't going to be a big problem. For a new guy that only gets to fly on weekend, maybe a problem. But always be aware of the same plane can be dialed into two completely different modes. The one mode where it's real stable, it's going to do beautiful rounds, be very easy to fly, be very stable. The other one where it's going to be a little twitchier, a little jumpier, be able to define corners a little bit better, define triangles, tops of hourglasses. And, and then you always have that you can set the plane up for these conditions and mark exactly what, what the, the trim issues were. Or in this case, have a, a certain amount of nose weight that you add when you want to fly this style of flying. But again, if you know it ahead of time, and that's what we've been working on, these things, they, they seem like they're endless. You could have a plane that's 10 years old and still be pushing the envelope every time you fly it. And that's, of course, the enjoyment that I get out of flying. It, Rich Oliver and I have even talked about this. To just go to the field and fly 10 practice flights, I don't think I could do it. I've got to have something to work on, something to test, something to try something to to manipulate to see if I can constantly move move that envelope out anyway hope that information works for everybody and we got some wheel pants drying I'm gonna go see if that silver is ready to sand I'm, I'm itching to see what those wheel pants are gonna look like once the silver is sanded out now I'm trying to keep track of something here this is this is not an important thing but we we're way over hundred degrees out there and I, I waited exactly an hour to see if this, if this dope would powder off. So what I'm doing is I'm just taking some 320 dry paper. Because we have so many dry and rough spots here, I'm just going to dress it off, get the next coat of silver on. I'm, at, I'm just using the silver as filler and to fill in the dry spots. If I find any big gouges, I'll fill them in with the, uh, the red lead and nitrous stain. But I don't see any on that on this one anyway. Oh yeah, there are up in the front here. There's a few. Anyway, that's the idea of the silver. Is it always shows you the the big mistakes? Or actually, it shows even the little mistakes. But it's nice in in terms of being able to. Now you wouldn't want to finish a whole plane this quickly, but I'd like to get the finish on the wheel pants here. Is you know in a timely fashion. I I don't want to spend a month putting a finish on it. And that's what Brodak Dope allows you to do, is make, make some time up. 
Other brands of dope, there's no way an hour later you're sanding it. That's that's a pipe dream, but comes off like powder, you're ready to sand it. Now what I try to do on the on the initial sand out is leave plenty of extra material. There's plenty of spots on here that are gonna need two or three coats of silver. There's a little bit of talc in a silver so it fills right in. And this is a this is a, a very quick, in fact I, sh I ought to leave a little extra where it goes over the wire. That may be a good thing. I'll put a little piece of silk span there maybe. We'll see how that sands out. But a little ding like this, a little low spot I could put nitrous stain. I'll wait and see if I get one more coat on. Because what I was thinking might be a good idea is just get maybe two coats on this before I sand it again. I can get a coat now, an hour or so later, then let it dry overnight. So that that's what looks like building up that silver base, finding the mistakes, getting it done as soon as possible. Actually, this is going to go very quickly. And then we should be ready for a coat of red. Well, I'm wishing we could save some of this heat for the uh, for the winter. You figure in a, in a winter we pay 600 a month for heat, and in the summer we pay 600 a month to cool the house off. What's wrong with that picture? Anyway, each time I do this, the dry spots will become less, hopefully. Minimized. Sometimes it takes three, four coats to get a nice, a nice base on it. And I remember old Bobby Brookins, it used to make him crazy. I'd, <laughs> we're gonna see him up in, in uh, Midgley's contest. But I'd, I'd put a coat of paint on and I'd just keep, what I call one coat is when the whole thing is soaking wet. And he puts a coat on, and that's a coat of paint. But then he's a professional, so I don't know. Bob, we're talking about you. I see in this temperature, you almost, it's almost dry by the time you turn it over and paint the other side. So we'll get plenty of material on. I'll get two coats about an hour apart. Tomorrow we'll come back and sand this again. Now it's, it's still over 100 degrees, so I don't dare put this in the sun. In the shade, but never in the sun. And we'll pick that, pick up the sanding on that tomorrow. Might be ready for some wet sanding. Every morning on the way to the flying field, I look at these scoops and I start thinking, how am I going to get something unique and different for next year's plane? I've been looking at more cars lately than I ever looked at in my life. Anyway, it looks like it's going to have a nice day at the field. Get to test those four blades. See if we can just get some flights. Now, just notice something. On a normal work day, this is a weekday, you'd have 100 to 200 people walking and jogging. Because of the heat, we don't have anybody. Almost nobody here. Boy, it looks like we'll have the whole field to ourselves today. One, there's one car here. 110 in the shade, so I better not park in the shade. I was hoping for a little bit better test day, but because of the heat and the wind has already come up, it's already rocking and rolling and coming over the trees, and it's in an angle where we can't even shoot video. Of course, we'd be shooting right into the sun. But the four blade has shown some promise. Now, the other thing that's nice about it is if you're building a scale plane, now John Cofaro's building a P-51 where having a scale prop would be a big advantage. Well, this certainly is one that'll work out. You certainly can dial this in to, to the best, I guess, thrust that you'd want to have for a model, especially a scale model, if it was a Mustang or whatever, a Thunderbolt, whatever. 
Now, and, and as a side benefit, this prop is actually lighter than the one, the two blade that we had on there before. And it's definitely lighter than Randy's two blade, which is a, a real heavy duty prop that we've cut down, of course. Now this is cut to about 13 right now. And that's a good, I guess a good starting point. A little bit more if you're gonna run the motor with, uh, you know, no head gaskets and a, a big Venturi. A little bit less if you're going to choke it down and put a couple extra head gaskets in and we've had both options in a plane already. Now what's always interesting for me is to take the same prop that goes in and, and dials into this particular setup and put it in the Spitfire which we'll probably do later in the week because the Spitfire is considerably lighter considerably smaller so props that on this plane tend to be a little wimpy or not not strong are usually wind up perfect in a Spitfire. Props that are a little frisky in a Spitfire, a little drivey and powerful, overpower it. They seem to be just about right for this. So anyway, we're going to get it whatever I can in terms of flying today. It's not going to be possible to shoot video because look what we're looking into. We're looking right into the sun. Downwind is right into the sun, but we'll get a uh, as many flights as I can on this. And at the end of the day, Evaluate it against the two blade. Drink a gallon or so of Poland spring water. Boy, it's nice. You know what's nice is, look at, look at this, there's nobody here. It, it's like the world is abandoned. No joggers, nobody. Once it gets over 100 degrees, boy, does that, does that shake out all the people that aren't serious about stuff. Anyway, and at the end of a day like this, well, you know what we're going to do. We're going to go home and work on those wheel pants, try to get them in red today due to wet sanding. Got a lot of other little projects to work on, and we want to get the Spitfire ready because sooner or later I want to have both planes at the field so I can do prop tests on the lighter plane, the smaller plane, and the bigger plane, and then mix and match. And in, and in doing so, then I build a good database that I can work on for the future. And when it comes to recommending what prop can go on a plane and usually I can get it right a lot quicker than if I didn't do those tests. Now it's it's time we've got three coats of silver on here they've all been dry sanded and now it's time to start picking away the errors and I need to well let me show this on a close-up lens because no matter what part you're doing, this is going to be a this is going to be an issue all the time, and we didn't tissue these, which means we need we still need to put a little more paint on. Usually, if you tissue it, you can get away with a little less paint. There's still some spots on here, and I want to show how I would go about touching them up. So let's look at each piece, because these are the same errors that are going to occur on any part, a cowling or whatever. Now you can see right here, there's a spot where I'll call it a dry spot for lack of a better word. So what I want to do is I want to take a little piece of 320 dry. You never want to sand this wet until it's sealed and this is not sealed. So I want to go over this spot. This is a spot where the paint really isn't sticking the way it should. And if you're doing an untissued surface you're going to get these spots where for whatever reason either there's a fingerprint there or, or something. And if we paint over that again, we're going to ultimately wind up with what amounts to be a bubble. Now, so the first thing I'll do is sand this down. Let me get a piece of... I want to identify where these spots are. Now, since it's nice and smooth there, it's not much of a problem, but I still have to seal it. Now, there are several ways to seal this. I could go out and put three or four more coats of clear, spray the whole part, or I can do this. Let me show this. Let me just show this a little. Let me get some stuff over here. This is what I call the quick finish. That should seal it. And right away, before it's even dry, I want to just just touch it with the sandpaper. Now I was in Barnes & Noble last night with Karen, she was buying some bird books, and I saw a book, The History of Paint. For anybody that's really interested in these type of things, 
I was amazed. I started reading it and I was tempted to buy it, except it was a $49 book. Now, even to the point of if I can feel it, that it's a little rough there. And of course, these are things you can do over and over and over. The thing you don't want to do is sand this wet. What we're trying to do is create a seal and get the paint to stick down onto the material. Yeah, just get another piece of sandpaper. At this point, it doesn't really matter. 320 is fine. And I like using the sticky paper. But there's plenty of spots on this. Now, as soon as I get to the point where I can't feel it, then I'm ready to move on to the next spot. Now, here's a couple of a couple other little tips. Once you've wiped these parts down with CA thick or thin, it doesn't matter. There's hard spots on this. And what would happen now, if you went to wipe something smooth, you can put gouges in it. So what I do is I try to get rid of this as soon as possible. Get a new sheet. Go to the next spot, which I can see right down here. I've got some pretty much the same thing. These are dry spots. These are spots where there isn't enough paint. And because what happened is in the final sand out, they were high spots. They were mountaintops. Every time I sanded it, I'd cut through and take away some of that material, and I'd be back down into raw wood. These, these in essence, are mountaintops. So I treat it the same way. I try to get it as, as smooth as possible. When I can't feel the area anymore, then I know I'm ready for some material. And again, I can do this over and over until I'm satisfied. Because I want to see a coat of silver that doesn't have any dry spots or any imperfections before I go painting the red. Otherwise, I'm just building up the surface in red, and the red won't have any talc in it, so it won't fill these spots as quickly as the silver does. You can see how quickly this, the silver fills and sands. Like old Brodak dope, it just sands right off powder. You can see the powder. You can write your name in it. Now there was another spot on here and typically this is where the dry spots are. is up along the leading edge because you're breaking through all the time. Again, no trick to how to do this. Once you understand the concept of it's either painted or it doesn't have enough paint. And it has to be sealed before you can wet sand it. Otherwise the water or the M600 or the Windex or whatever you're going to use as a carrying agent in the wet sanding is going to wind up being a problem. It's going to go down into the wood and swell it up. Now once I get where I think it's okay, again I'll try to seal it as best I can and it's the edges that always seem to be the most vulnerable to sanding through. Get rid of this towel now. We've wiped two things with it. And I just keep, a lot of times you can feel one. Now here's one, not sure if you can see it, right up here. But what's going to happen, if this wasn't silver, you wouldn't see that. But watch what happens. As soon as you sand the silver, you can see the high spot coming right through. It comes immediately right through. So the same technique. Just seal it. And don't hold the paper towel in any, don't hold it there, it'll just stick. Keep it moving. And this is a thing you can do over and over until this part is going to be sealed and have a coat. Now right up here I see a couple more little spots. And I know as soon as I go here I'm going to break through and hit the wire. That's another problem. So I'll be judicious when I sand it there. But I'm going to try, again, I'm going to try to sand this out very carefully. Get another coat of silver and because it's 100 plus degrees out there, this should really dry up very quickly. Today we can get back maybe and wet sand it. I would say minimum an hour in 100 degree weather. As long as it's powdering off, the test is always if it powders off, whether it's aeropoxy or whether it's paint, you're ready to go to the next step. 
Now, even in the back here, another vulnerable area. Anytime you have an edge, like the leading edge of the wing, leading edge of the stab, cowl edges, that's where you're always going to need an a little extra material. Even just so that in time, as time goes by, you don't wind up, well, wearing through the paint. And I like to have, it's my personal choice, I'd like to have planes, let me get rid of this towel. I'd like to have, if possible, planes that are 8, 10, 15 years old, as some of them are that are still flying, and, and still have them look pretty decent. Not have them look like they belong in junkyard wars. Now see what wiped down there? Doesn't matter at all. And again, you can just go over and over and over, and when this whole part is what I hope sealed, it'll be ready for the next coat of silver. It's going to be a nice shape. Now our other one presents a real problem, is that, is that we've really sanded through, let me get up close, and you can see how rough we've, we've over sanded, we're back down into raw wood there. Again, technique for repairing that. And by the way, the reason I'm working with, a lot of the time with rubber gloves is to avoid getting, in this temperature especially, sweaty, greasy fingerprints, because just before I was working here, I was working with the epoxy from the tune pipes, and that tends to just get on everything. It just makes a mess. It's a very thin liquid. The more I can wear the gloves, it, it just protects your hands, keeps you from getting, uh, well, the whole myriad of problems that come when you have a cut on your hand and you get epoxy in it, or CA. Okay, now I'm sanding this back down, just as a kind of a show and tell how to do this. In this case, I know I'm going to need a little extra material because I am really down into raw wood here. So what I can do as a first step, I can do the usual thing with the thin. The thin seals it, penetrates real well, seals it. You never want to just leave it on there more than a second or two. Now once that's done and that's penetrated in, And it's still, it's not even dry yet. I'm scuffing it up because that's going to let the next coat bond. It's going to give it a tooth, a physical tooth. Let the next coat bond right in there. And a lot of times if it's really bad, I mean if you're down into absolute raw wood and it's raw wood sticking up, you can always put some thick CA on there too. But each coat, you shouldn't just put coat after coat, each coat should get a tooth. Anyway, those are some of the tips that I'm using in the process of sanding the silver out. The wheel pants are a, a very complex shape, there's absolutely no straight angles on them, everything is a curve of some kind. And everything that's curved blends into another curve, so it's very time-consuming doing this, but I think well worth it. In the final analysis, if we're going to be using these wheel pants, we might use these wheel pants for the next who knows how many years. And every time I look at them, I don't want to see any mistakes that I possibly don't have to. Now just looking at this real close, this, there's no dry areas on the bottom, that looks real good. Looks like the same thing. Here, I'll do this one off camera, it's basically the same, little dry spots. And once, then I'll do, I'll final sand everything with a brand new piece of 320, get outside, and get another coat of silver on there. And I'm hoping I'm only one or two coats, and, and see, it doesn't matter if you use ten coats, five coats, one coat, because each coat, before you put the next coat on, should get almost all sanded off. You're just using this as filler. Now I'm looking for any dry spots that are still on here. To try to give it a little extra material there if there is a dry spot. But as soon as I have no dry spot, uh, there's one dry spot there. As soon as I have no dry spots left, 
Then I'll be ready to sand this with wet sand it, hopefully not go through. I'm putting a lot of extra material on the parts where I know I had to repair it this year. Thanks to Brodag Dope, an hour from now, we should be able to, well, in this heat. I think out in, in Rich Oliver's part of the world, you can paint a plane in one day. And once again, they can be in the heat, but not in direct sun while that's drying. We're gonna give it an hour. In this temperature, I'm, a, I'm almost sure it'll be dry even sooner. Now because we anticipate doing some more testing, the Spitfire, here, and this is a tip, this is something I bet everybody out there thinks, oh yeah I do that, but think about it, do you really do it? Now we haven't flown this plane in a few months. It's been sitting on a wall and sitting on a floor and everything, and what happens is the, the wax that's on there probably isn't as effective as it was when I put this away when we were done testing in the, in the spring. So what's happened is we have really unprotected paint here. And this was the original Brodak Dope test finish. If you have the Brodak Dope uh, videos, you know this is the plane we built during that time. Now it's just a matter of personal pride. Before I go out and fly it again, I like to wax it. The reason is, and I'll wax the whole plane, there's a simple reason. What happens is there's going to get little spots of raw fuel up around the front of the wing, up on the nose. And if I don't have a coat of wax on, I'm going to get those ugly white spots. And everybody that, that has ever had that happen to them, or you fuel in a plane and a couple of drops get somewhere, well, a coat of wax is cheap, cheap insurance. Another thing, this is a Kent Tyser little tip. These are microfibers. Buy them in any car parts store. I don't know what it says, Mr. Microfiber or whatever. Microfibers. What happens with microfibers, a couple of things, you can clean your glasses with them. If you look at an eyeglass cleaning, uh, professional eyeglass, eyeglass cleaners, they use microfibers. But well, one thing they're good for, and by the way, this is mother's, anytime I'm waxing, I want something with carnuba, carnuba. Not spray wax or pledge or something like that. Carnuba is the agent that protects it. You'll notice if you, if you wax, even go wax your van or your car with microfibers, you'll notice much, much easier to get the old wax off. Leaves a much nicer shine. Now I just demonstrated this. And I like to put on three or four coats. I like to let it sit about an hour between coats. And then this, this ship should be ready to fly. Now that dope is from 1999. It's now seven years old. That still has a nice finish. I'm not so sure if I did the, the repair on that wingtip and a little repair up on a nose and a cowl, this wouldn't still be a front row plane. I'm not so sure, but I like to keep it as nice as I possibly can. The biggest single issue is when it sits for a long time and you haven't flown it, put a coat of carnu wax on it. Just protect it from all those ugly little white fuel dots and fly, in, in our case, we fly into bugs and birds and stones and everything. Nothing like a nice coat of wax to bring it back and this is seven year old dope I'll bet when this is 10 or 15 years old it'll be just as nice and it's just something to be said for doing the maintenance now in today's mail I just got the gift of the century here from Jim Smith in Florida you, re you may remember him from the Brodak videos Look at this. It's a flag. Oh, it covers my whole workbench. Look at this. Now, I was just thinking how cool this would be. I got Actually, I'm going to go get a flagpole this afternoon, some kind of big PVC pipe or something, so that I can, uh, when we go to a contest or whatever, I can display this. This will be really cool. I don't know where. I, look at the size of this thing. It actually goes over the... It's a giant flag. 
John Cafaro, look at the size of this thing. From Jim Smith. Now, Jim, believe me, I appreciate this like you can't imagine. I gotta find some way to. I'm guessing a PVC pipe like Rich Jackabone has would be a cool thing to do. Wow, that is really cool. Jim, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. That is really something special. Now, I would love to put this out in front of my house. The only problem is we display the American flag because of 9-11. And since 9-11, half of the people on our block, and I sure don't want to stop that, the patriotism with all the nonsense going on in the world today. But boy, oh boy, that is one special gift. Jim, we're going to find some way of using this, trust me. This is, this is going up at the field somehow. I don't know how yet. So do I get any respect now? <laughs> wow, that is cool. Now here's the deal though. If we could figure a way to get it up on top of that flagpole, is this electrical wire here? All right, let's let's get a, uh, I gotta get a ladder or something. Get Mike Kajeski to climb up there and put yeah, it up they're there. They're gonna leave it there. Take it off. Yeah, that'd be cool though. You need oh, you something need like what I got. Yeah, you keep, keep it to cover your airplane with. No, I want to make a flag to put on the other side of the field. We'll oh. have one on Ferrari and Enzo on the other side of the field here. Oh, God. I gotta go down to the uh, pool to see if they have an aluminum tube like that. See if they got it. You want to go? Well, I'm gonna fly today. Today's, look at this, no air, no dead air. That's what we're no looking for. Okay. You got Dead. Bottles. Oh. I wanted. I brought the Spitfire out. I thought I'd do some prop testing for Rich Oliver, but uh, we got no air. That ends that. All right, see you Johnny. All right. See you later, Johnny. That's it. I won't see you today. Home Depot. Tomorrow morning. Look at that flag. Jim, we're using it every day, Jim. We love it. Now, I really was hoping we'd get a little bit better air today for doing some of this test. I brought the Spitfire because I wanted to go back and forth with the props. I had a lot of grandiose plans, but uh, when it's dead here, the problem is you really can't back up here. We're surrounded by fences and dead air. I'd actually be better if the air is dead going to the club field where I can back pedal all I want. But I'm going to get some flights and I want to get back and work on those wheel pans. Well, you can see there is no air here at all. And if you back pedal too much here and you get out of that range, you'd be eating that fence. That's not good. But the temperature has come down about 10 degrees, so I guess I shouldn't complain. And I really want to get those wheel pants worked on today more than anything else. Check this out, we got a fox on our field for the second day. Here he is. And he wants to change the prop on a Testarossa. Hey Rich, grab that prop, the prop's loose. I was going back and forth with the four blade and the two blade. And it looks like the two blade won today. And there goes the fox, he's disgusted with our test program. So, it started out dead and it's gotten unflyably windy. And when this kind of conditions come up, I know the two blade always seems to be the winner. So we're back, as we always are. The wind is starting to get unflyable, and it's time to put the two blade back on the plane. And I have to say, as many times as I've done the test, three blade, four blade, two blade, and once get to this point in the day, a couple hours into the heat and the wind of the day, it seems like the two-blade always wins. Now, depending on how good the woodwork is, you can see this side, not too bad. But this side, we still have, well, it's right in the front, too, on the bottom. And when you paint the silver, and I was just talking to Mike Scott today, Mike's thinking about doing a refinish on his plane, and what I think what I think can get him the most bang for the buck is just 
sand and the silver more. See, because if we try to paint over this, there's no way that's going to come out real nice. So again, I take a brand new number 11 blade, wherever this is really rough. Now, what this means is I didn't really do enough sanding on this when it was in raw wood. So I want to put plenty of little pinholes in here, turn it into a pin cushion. The more pinholes, the better. And this is a really good trick. Now this would be less important if we had silk spanned it. The silk span would have made up for some of this, but I didn't want to silk span this because where the legs are, it's a reverse curve. It's like, like a fillet is. And I just anticipated that in the past when I've, when I've done this, it pops the silk span. Let me get the phone while we continue this. Now I want to get back to this. Even if you have silk span over this area, a lot of times there'll be what it looks like a bubble, a dry spot, and the answer is wherever you see it lifting. Now I want to see if I can really get one. Now here's an exact perfect example right here. Now especially if like if Mike Scott is is refinishing a plane, you're going to have bubbles wherever there's oil or fingerprints or anything. Or if you don't wear rubber gloves when you work on a model, it almost guarantees. Bunch of little holes. Put some thin CA. Try to get fresh CA, not stuff that's 10 years old. Wait a second and then rub it in. As soon as you feel a little resistance, it's the dust in the paper towel that seems to kick it off. Now it can be sanded because you've got a bind. You've got the paint and or the silk span binding to the material underneath it. Now a lot of these, I mean when you paint a car you don't have these kind of problems because you're painting metal. And you're painting in such thick coats, you don't have this. You have primers that are an eighth of an inch thick. Well, you can't really do that to a model unless you're, unless you're looking to make it in a 90 ounce plane. Now I'm just looking here for other little imperfections. And again, anywhere you see an imperfection, now down here I can see that, and, and again, I've already put some thin CA on here, but I can even do this 2, 3, 8, 10, 15 times because I'm going to fill it with paint. And in this case, I'm just filling it with silver that has a little bit of talc in it. If I was doing a Tiger Cat, I'd fill it with black paint with a little bit of talc in it. Or if I knew this model was white, I'd do it with, you know, some maybe just clear or whatever. But in this case, these are going to be red. And that red that Bob Brookins made, the Ferrari red, covers anything. You can paint, you saw I painted a spinner, a black carbon spinner with red. And it goes right over it. But that's when you pay $250 for a quart of paint. It better cover And if you're ever needing custom colors, custom that they're not made, one source of this stuff, you can get Bob Brookins to make it for you, or get you to pigment, or turn you on to a website where they have it for sale. Midgley's done that many times. Okay, now, now once these things, we hope what we've done is nail this material down. Now we can go back, take some, and this is 320, and just go over those spots lightly. That'll kill the edge where the edge of the CA ends and the material begins. But now where the material is, it's hard. It's not raw wood. And if we have a dry spot on the next coat, we just go back and keep doing this until we don't have any dry spots. And the answer is, and, and it used to be, uh, if I remember right, Harold Price was the first one that told me this, is you got to do as many coats of silver as it takes and sand them as many times until there's no flaws and it looks like the plane is made out of one piece of aluminum. Well, well you can see we're having a busy day here. <laughs> Let me get the phone. So the final thing here, and I started doing this while I was on the phone, is because we're into this a few coats of the silver now, and it really doesn't matter, but this is some 600 sandpaper, wet. I never want to sand wet while there's spots that I'm going through. See, and I'm kind of thinking maybe I will go through here, but I've tacked it down pretty well. Once I get this wet sanded out, M600 or Prepsol's Choice 1, Windex Choice 2, water with a little soap, Choice 3. And we'll be ready to shoot a coat on this and see what we got. And each coat hopefully looks a little bit nicer, a little bit fewer dry spots. The nice thing if you do use M600 is you usually don't get any contamination even if you don't use gloves when you're working on a part. 
And I want to thank Bobby Brookins again, who sent me a gallon. It's unobtainable at any price in our area now, thanks to the lovely government. God forbid we should have a good degreasing agent. But he did send me a gallon, so I think we're pretty well set for the next model. Anyway, I'm going to set up the compressor and get some spraying. See what this next coat's going to look like. Now it was supposed to cool down today, well it cooled down to 87. Now what I want to, any of the spots that were dry, I want to get a little bit extra material on there. That's the dry spot. Now what I'm going to do is, just put that little dry spot where, the, where we just did the repairs. I'm going to let this sit for about a minute and then spray the whole part. And once those spots have kind of dried, now I can just go into the normal, normal paint routine. So what happens is where those spots are, there's, extra, there's actually an extra whole coat. And it looks like, see, you'll see these little pinholes where the, for the first few times you put paint on, you'll see the pinhole. And after that, once the clear is on, once the red is on, that'll be gone. I think we're only one, it looks like we're one coat away right now. Today was such a funny day. It started out dead air, totally dead. And by the end of the day, uh, <laughs> holy mackerel was it blowing. In fact, if you look back at that video, the prop was blowing off the flame when I was changing props. Again, even at 87 degrees, this is this is going to be ready for a sand out. Oh, uh, an hour. By the time I uh, I got some other project, I'm making a custom tune pipe for the uh, the Testarossa right now. I'll show that later, but still working on it. We got the next step on our, on our one of a kind custom tune pipe here. That's going to be an experiment that we're going to work on pretty soon. But lessons okay, here doing drawings. Right so the design king is over there with a sketch pad talking to Rich Oliver. And the next Enzo is starting to take shape already as he figures out where to put the scoops. As we're waiting, I can't even open the doors here. You notice how the, the wheel turns? You turn the wheels, and the wheels turn. This is a pretty cool little thing. Yeah. I'm sure that more than one person has told him, you know, Bradley would, and he continues to do it with incredible bravado. Yeah. What do you think, Chicky? Should we fire him or hire him? <laughs> mm. I don't know. Let's face the fact that Testarossa is going to be a hard act to follow. A very hard act to follow, damn it. Now today, while everything's drying up, I want that, <clears throat> hopefully that last coat of silver will dry up. One more coat of silver, we'll be putting some red on those wheel pants. And in the meantime, I'm hoping today's gonna be a good flying day and we can get some more testing on these props. It looks like it's gonna be a good one and we're up early. This time of the day, Rutherford is a beautiful place to just drive through. Another day of prop testing, another day with the two blade winning. Now, what we're gonna do with Rich's plane today, I brought my whole stack of three blades. He's got his stack of three blades over there because he's been trying to buy this prop, a spare, and he has no spare. So even though this, and this is my old prop, 
it's it's kind of uh, risky to be running a whole program when you don't have a spare prop that's exactly the same and on the plane balanced and tested so he's gonna start working with the spare props that he had and we'll just put this one away until we can get a well a spare see everything I have I have at least two of the four blades the three blades the two blades but unfortunately with, with the two blades uh, we're we're kind of running out of we only got one that's full size still because of picking up the stones in this parking lot. But anyway, it looks like a nice day. Hope we're gonna have a good day. And hope when we get home, hope the wheel pants are all dried up from sitting out in the backyard. And hope we know a little bit more about props than when we got here this morning. The one you got in your hand has the most pitch and it's very hot now. So for a hot day, you want the most pitch. If you shorter. start with this one and you don't have enough drive, you're dead. The rest of them have less pitch. I can take it to the exhaust. Try it one flight. If you want to fly back-to-back -back flights, it's okay because we're not missing any air here. This little one is, it looks like a 40 prop. But these other ones, you know, they have a lot of... The, these, these were for your 65. They're made to run at 10 grand. This motor runs at 9,000. But I think that one's going to be okay. Okay, you're going to... The way you're going to do it, if this, if this turns out to be okay, you're fine. But if this is too slow, then the other props have less pitch. You're screwed. You know what I'm saying? You, you only can go one way here. And the way I can prove this is a Testarossa prop, look, it says right on it, Testarossa. It doesn't say Rich Jacobona. Yeah, right over. Tell you something. Uh, uh, I traded you for a uh, different prop. No, 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 I no, gave no. You a darn prop. Uh, you got a receipt with my signature on it. You get it to be like Ryan Ethan. Oh, don't say that. No, no, no. Anything but that. Any, prop, you remember? Any, uh, yeah, I made them plenty of them. What, what if you what if you copied an Ethan prop? So what are you gonna do? You gonna try the other one? Yeah, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna put the Doran prop on. Okay. And see what comes up. So what's the matter with this prop that you have on it? Not enough drive? Needs more pitch? That mm. one, the one that I have. It's gonna need more pitch. Prop test, prop test, prop test. Is there anything more boring in the whole world? Every time I see some scoops like this on a car, I start thinking about next year's plane. As Rich is going through his stack of props, what he's finding out is they all were pitched for the 65, which runs about a thousand RPM faster. They all have not enough pitch. So what, I took my stack of three blades, these are all Doran three blades, and we're gonna see if if this is going to be any better of a match because my props are basically pitched for somewhere around 9,000 where a 65 runs around 10,000 so but what's happening and it's a real good thing in a lot of ways Rich is learning a lot about prop technology as the day goes on and we're, we're basically giving him the rest of the day the rest of the air and everybody here seems to be uh, bored to death actually as Rich goes round and round, but he's learning. And this is the only way that I know you can make any progress. You gotta get out to the field and, and kiss a couple days away learning about this stuff. Or you gotta get a copy of that prop DVD from Wendy and see if you can pick up some good information. So as the day grinds on and Rich grinds on, What's going to wear out first? Rich or the prop nut? <laughs> or is Rich the prop nut? <laughs> what do you think, John?
Uh, Brian, uh, about a year ago, started pitching his own props. He's got gauges for all his props. He's learned a lot. So you put another push rod in there, huh? A stronger push rod? You got a good day to fly. Okay, this is a new guy, never flown before. Brian's gonna give him a flying lesson. You hear from Bob? Windy? Well, when Raul back said. Up, back up! Back up! Fire oh, into the poles and trees! Oh my god, look at this. Where, where are you? When Raul sets the needle, boy, it's set. It's got to be a little richer, Raul. Teach the kid at 150 miles an hour. Raul, it's too lean when it does that. Richen it up. Balsa and, uh, and silk. Oh, it isn't. Ooh, ooh. Well, I guess Brian's ready to teach him the landing. <laughs> Where? Why did he land? You better, you better double his pay, Raul. Why did he... I mean, it's such a short distance. Okay, Raul. Somebody threw a loaf of out. somebody threw a loaf of bread out. We got birds coming all over the place here. The birds are. Oh, it's a seagull. Oh, seagull almost just got whacked. You get no seagull respect here when you, you try to eat hand? a loaf of bread. Today, it's going to run some real fast. I'm glad we're not working in a nuclear I don't facility. A, I don't have a bent Jeez. tube. <laughs> you got a bent. All he needs is a cap to cap off the yeah, top. I'll take it off, Mike. Oh man, Raul, these are ABCs of stunt. You know, I, I, I never. Hey, uh, watch this here. He's. Excuse us, Raul. So they, they cap off the wrong vent. That's why they can't get a motor on. Unbelievable. Now it's time to see what our parts are going to look like once we get some red on. Not sure we want to get in the sun here. Again, this is the paint Bob Brookins had custom mixed with real Ferrari pigment, Brodac clear. Covers very quickly. But, but the trick is to get that silver perfect before you go putting any color on. You want to minimize and put the minimum amount of color paint on. sure you can even really see the color here but it really where these edges are a little extra once that dries up and in this temperature an hour from now we'll be putting clear on here once that dries the only thing left is going to be I guess four or five coats of clear an hour apart we'll buff it out and we'll be ready to put on a plane Now we're ready to shoot some Rodak clear on these. I like to get two or three nice wet coats on. Give it an hour or so to dry between. And this temperature, not sure if you can see the color. The Rodak clear really brings out the color. If you do all the careful preparation on the, uh, the silver coats, from this point on, it's absolutely a joy.
put these in the shade to dry. But they're going to be a nice set. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how these look on the plane and how they're going to look in flight. And while these are drying, I spoke to Larry Fernandez today. Larry Fernandez has a pet baby owl. He found a baby owl at the flying field. Can you believe that? A baby owl. And we're supposed to get pictures of it in the next week. Larry, of course, one of our favorite people, and boy, oh boy, a pet owl. I just can't believe it. Anyway, we'll have some pictures soon. Well, one of the things here, Les has been coming up with conceptual ideas, of course, and we've been going back and forth with this over the past week. But one of the things, I just wanted to give a little sneak preview, haven't even tested this yet, one of the things I thought of was, we're always looking for a unique way to exhaust out the bottom of the plane. And I thought, this, this kind of looks like, now John Caffaro had the original idea with this. He said, if you put a, a car upside down, so these are coming out the top. Well, I don't know about the guy launching a plane, might not go for that, but having that. Now what I did is, and, and I'll put a real quick thing carefully to, uh, to tell you how I worked this out. This has two baffles. It has a baffle at the spot that we we know we need to baffle here and then an extra chamber just because this may or may not have a different tone or a frequency I didn't want to disturb because it's from the baffle forward that it matters. Everything back here, back here you can put newspaper if it'll quiet the plane down and not restrict it. So this was one of my conceptual ideas. And I had just run the idea out by less to have these exhausts right out the bottom. Now the problem is the way we exhausted out the Testarossa, as the summer wore by, the paint got bubbled and deteriorated from the real, the, the exhaust just wearing on it, I guess is the right way. And we're going to have to refinish this bottom part of the fuselage in the winter time once we, once we finish for the flying season. That's going to be one of the refinish things. <clears throat> we never got to do the, the Spitfire refinish, so I think we need to have like a refinish week in the time coming up. But anyway, thinking about how this would look with, again, everything is, is conceptual right now. But to make something this unusual and this different, you really just can't start with a, a kit and, and change the wingtips and stuff. This is going to be a very, very unique thing. Now, what Les had thought about doing is making it a twin rudder ship and having the rudders removable so you could fly it without the rudders or with the rudders. Or having a replaceable rudder a center rudder that would come off again just ideas we're kicking around back and forth I wanted to share at this point in time but everything's dried up on the wheel pants now and I think they're ready to buff out well, this has about five coats of Brodac clear and this is the kind of finish that you wind up with when you do the silver sanding the way I do it. You, what happens is you pay the price in sanding the silver early on but now at this point in doing this this is this is a matter of minutes to buff this out. This will be very very quick to buff out and I wanted to well I, the, the way I've always done it and believe me there are many other methods 1200 sandpaper now thanks to Bob and thanks to Bobby Brookins we do have a little bit of M600 and on this M600, of course, is always the choice for a wet sanding. But if I pick a spot, and, and it's, it doesn't matter, I always like to show. If you can let this dry an extra day, and we did, we went to the Sussex County Fair to see all the, uh, all the things that you see at our fairs, the cows, the chickens, some exotic stuff. But anyway, now this should be ready. The, the step one is, and Nice thing about the M600, if you sand through a spot, you don't get all that puckering of the wood that you do with water or Windex or whatever. But the first step is to get it perfectly flat. Again, this is not real rocket science. You've got it that... I forgot to get a towel. And it's got to be flat. Now you can do it all, I, my, my, the way I like to do it is I like to get the whole surface flat like that. 
if you were to let this dry an extra few days, it'll sand out even easier. Then once it's at that point, our old friend Gorums. What else could there be but Gorums? And again, there's a lot of other materials, finesse it, everybody, different compounds in the two to three thousand grit range. I don't know what Gorums is. I've heard it's two thousand, but it may be twenty five hundred. And it really just this is this is gonna be a matter of maybe five or ten minutes. I can be watching TV while I'm doing it. I don't need to really pay attention because I've got enough material on here that I really shouldn't go through. Once this is polished up, I just need to fit up the Ferrari wheels that have the Bob Zambelli hubs. And then the coolest part, getting it on the airplane. And that it just buffs very, very quickly right up into a shine. And you can see where it's flat and where it's got the shine buffed into it. And actually, even if you left it this shiny, <laughs> You'd probably be, you'd probably be in the front three rows anyway. But but what happens with this is now it feels it. You rub this on your arm or on your cheek, the feel. And now as you wax this and clean it, and again, I don't want to wax this at minimum a month. I want to keep this so that the finish is hardening up. And I don't want to put it in a bright sun where there's any chance it's going to bubble up. Get this. The man and his exhaust. Can you figure a way to get that into the design? Hey, the other thing we can do, you know, with this, these can go out sideways. You know, but when you get it, so he has his concept drawing. But when, no, when you, Enzo yeah. Demet here is trying to decide. This is just a test, so I can run it. You have the test bench, by the way. We could run it as soon as we get a test bench. It's right out in the car. You could put this on a 90, in fact. <laughs> Now I gotta put the front end on. I haven't done the front end yet. Front end still isn't in. As soon as I do that, I'll get on the test bench and we can give it a shot. That'd be pretty cool. How many of these do you have opened up? All of them. Okay. You know, this is a hit and miss thing. What you gotta do is, is obviously, when you make the real pipe that's going in the plane, yeah. we, we gotta know where this gets too restrictive. And that'll be easy to figure out. Yeah. You just fill them with JB Weld for a test. You can do that right on a test bench. I want to hear what it sounds like, too. See, because the smaller you make this diameter, the further... It's like a garden hose now. It's getting the exhaust away from the plane. Yeah, right. There's which more. is what's happening on the, on the plane itself. What's happening is we're burning up the paint. See, the paint back there is really deteriorating from our, our Ducati exhaust system that... Uh, so, come up with some cool idea. Kafaro, somebody come up with it. And in the meantime, I'll work on how many, what the diameter of those 12 pipes has to be. And you could also exhaust out the side. I'm not, I'm not, I'm thinking, who cares about the guy launching a plane? Let him get his shoe wet. <laughs> Especially if it's rich. I mean, I didn't know, that the problem with this is if we took these less and made little elbows, you know how that, those little rubber elbows? Yeah. It would have been fine, but but by constantly back here, it just ultimately burned the paint yeah. off. Oh yeah, that's the problem. Once you introduce the exhaust gases into a large volume of air, they cool very quickly. Rectangular pipe. Oh, you can make. If you can draw it, I can make it. That's for sure. No. Nope. How can you make a rectangular pipe? Should you make a, a mandrel? You can make a mandrel out of anything. You can make it out of balsa wood. Put the, put the release agent on it, put a finish on it, release agent, just make sure it's got a draft angle. Make it out of foam. You can make it out of anything. You can make it out of a banana if you want. You know, as long as you can get a release agent on but, it. But, you know, I'm thinking now, you've got that carbon fiber channel, okay? Right. Now, so you, this, the pan comes in, that's carbon fiber. Right, okay? right. Okay? And then there's a little slit and a little slit and a flat right in there. I know. Well, get the sketch pad out while I'm making coffee here. I'm going to adjust the cross. So you can do a lot of things. Well, as we end this video, we, we've got more concepts going on. We still have a set of wheel pants. Maybe we'll donate them to Midgley. I don't know. Or we'll, we'll wind up putting a different engine in a plane or something, a four-stroke. I don't know. To balance them off. But anyway, we do have a good set of very practical grass gear for the contests that are coming up. We got the Enzo concepts coming out of our ears. 
And what was a dream just a year ago, pretty much has come to fruition. And it really, I think it, I think it looks pretty good with the wheel pants. I think that's just dynamite. But of course, all of this stuff is in the eye of the beholder. Well, you know me, I like larger wheel pants, but those aren't bad. They do look too small for the wheels. I just think, well, that's because we're going to be flying off of this crappy field. You could put, they're made for two inch wheels. I, if we could figure a way to get the gear blocks forward, you could use these. But with the gear blocks back, this is just doing this rocking horse thing every time it hits a bump. See, these don't rock that much. These, and because they're shorter, the rock is minimum. And Zambelli said he's got another set of those, the uh, Testarossa hubs. But of course, now we got to get him to get Enzo hubs. Now we need Enzo hubs. Wait, a guy doesn't even finish one project and we get another one going on him. So what do you think? Time for coffee? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Uh, coffee and some more ideas for the future. What a combo.